So we've heard very eloquent testimony to uh, the struggle for democracy uh, and the regression of democracy in two very important uh, transitional and bridging states uh, in the world, Ukraine and Turkey. Uh, in each case, uh, we have seen democracy desecrated uh, by uh, leaders who were elected uh, to defend the Constitution. In Ukraine, by the person who succeeded President Yushchenko, uh, President Yanukovych, the villain of the Orange Revolution, and then the villain of the um, undermining of democracy and opening the way for Vladimir Putin to uh, desecrate Ukrainian sovereignty. And then, of course, the gradual suffocation of democracy over a 10-year period by the elected prime minister, uh, Tayyip uh, Recep uh, Erdogan, in, uh, in Turkey and his Justice and Development Party, the AKP. Unfortunately, this is part of a trend that has been going on in the world uh, for about a decade or more now uh, that I call the democratic recession. And what this is, is a um, reversal of the 30 years of democratic progress, which you see on the slide behind me, showing in the red line on top the steady ascent in the number of electoral democracies and the more modest uh, ascent in the number of liberal democracies, as indicated in the blue line below, up until about 2005. 2005, 2006 seems to mark uh, in the history of uh, the third wave of global democratization a kind of inflection point where the progress of democracy came to a sudden and prolonged halt and has uh, been attended by a regression in levels of freedom, of political rights and civil liberties in the world. Here you see that from 1991 through 2005, in almost every year, the ratio of countries gaining in freedom in a particular year to countries declining in freedom was almost every uh, year in that 15-year period well above one. Sometimes one and a half, sometimes two times as many countries were gaining in freedom as were declining. But since 2006, you see the ratio in any given year has only been about half as many countries gaining in freedom as declining. Something is going on here, and we see it as well in the rising incidence of democratic breakdowns during this period of the third wave of global democratization that began in 1974. During the first decade of the third wave, when we didn't even know we were in a wave of democratic expansion, that was going to transform the world. Uh, in the far uh, left-hand bar of this slide, 1974 to 83, 15 percent of all the democracies that existed in the world failed during that decade. And then the rate declined to 7 percent in the second decade, 1984 to 93, and it's been steadily rising se since, to 10 percent in the subsequent decade and 14 percent in the decade after that. And then if you look at the next bar, uh, of all the democracies that have existed in this period of the last 40 years, fully 30% of them have failed. And if you look at only the democracies of the developing and post-communist world, the failure rate in the far right-hand bar has been 37%. This is a way of underscoring something we worry about in democratic studies, which is that democracy is a tough system to implement and consolidate and new democracies are highly vulnerable to regression and failure. Why is this? Why has democracy been slipping back in the world? There are many reasons that I don't have time uh, to review comprehensively, but I think the most important one is bad governance. It's a cycle that starts with weak institutions of rule of law, constitutionalism, representation, that are not well structured and embedded in the culture of a country, that enable relatively easy and wanton abuse of power in the way we've seen with the rise of Vladimir Putin in Russia, 
more incrementally and of late with the abuse of power by uh, Prime Minister Erdogan and his party in Turkey, leading to uh, widespread corruption, nepotism, and outright theft of state resources, as we have heard yesterday with Vladimir Putin becoming possibly the richest man and certainly the richest elected figure uh, in the world today, and a general climate which is certainly spreading in Russia and radiating out uh, beyond the borders of Russia and prevailing in many weak, fragile, and superficial uh, democracies of lawlessness, criminality, a weak rule of law. And underlying this and becoming an obstacle to the institutionalization of a deeper, better, and more durable democracy is a generalized lack of trust. Citizens don't trust one another. They certainly don't trust a state that is looting the national resources. And this makes it very hard to construct durable institutions of governance. Uh, this enables uh, would-be autocrats like Hugo Chavez to come to power on the promise of a populist revolution and then do in Venezuela what Putin did around the same time in Russia, betray the electoral promise, betray their obligations under the Constitution, and accumulate authoritarian power that they use to abuse constitutional rights and civil liberties uh, and lock up the opposition as Chavez has been doing and now as his successor, uh, Nicolas Maduro, is doing uh, at least as viciously. It led to the cynical exploitation of political power during the civil war in Sri Lanka under President Rajapaksa and the accumulation of a frightening degree of authoritarian power with now an aggressive impulse undermining the sovereignty of neighboring states like Georgia and Ukraine, as you heard very eloquently from President uh, Yushchenko, in the personality of, I think, one of the most dangerous men in the world today, not only for freedom, but for regional and international security, namely Vladimir Putin. And unfortunately, we are in a period of what we call authoritarian resurgence, where these principles and values of concentration of power, abuse of power, uh, lack of respect for international law and institutions are gaining, uh, as we see in China with the rise of President Xi Jinping, the most authoritarian ruler uh, of China and the most powerful ruler of China since Mao Zedong. Uh, the system in Iran, of course, uh, has been spreading its own authoritarian values throughout the region. And we see authoritarian rulers kind of gathering in alliances to defend one another. You see here President Lukashenko of Belarus, uh, uh, one of the most abusive um, uh, rulers, the President uh, Assad of Syria. They're all kind of defending and supporting one another in an increasingly integrated authoritarian conspiracy to frustrate uh, efforts for freedom and the defense of civil society and democratic values. One of the most important institutions by which they do so is the leading uh, club of autocracies in the world, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which brings together Russia, China, many of the states of Central Asia, Iran, and so on in a very, very pernicious and dangerous alliance. If we're going to fight what is becoming a deepening democratic recession and an invigorating authoritarian resurgence of anti-democratic values and practices, we have to make democracy work better. And the, most, the leading element of doing so has to be a war against corruption, a war that Democrats within uh, these emerging democracies of the third wave, as you see here in the streets of Argentina, in the streets of Brazil, you saw in the streets of Turkey, uh, in the elections uh, in Nigeria recently, as Democrats in civil society and the party system are rallying to do to try and get better governance. One key to better governance, it is crucial to underscore, is democracy itself, is clean, fair, transparent, neutrally administered elections with ballot boxes you can see through, and electoral administration that is accountable to no one 
but the principle of free and fair elections. And this is why Nigeria was able to achieve, for the first time in the 55-year history of the country as an independent state, a democratic election in which the opposition was able to take power in a national election and turn out the ruling party because they had, for the first time, truly honest and fair electoral administration. It is what is driving the movement for anti-corruption in India with the rise of this new political party, Am Admi, the common man's party, that wants to sweep clean the uh, stables of, a, of uh, corrupt and inept governance in India and renew the democratic promise. It is rising from the ground up uh, in India, in Latin America, in, in much of Africa, but very noteworthy fashion in India with the innovation of the Indian non-governmental organization Janagraha, which has developed this remarkable platform that I highly recommend to you called I Pay to Bribe, where we can now crowdsource corruption because citizens can pull out their mobile phone, go online, and report instances of corruption. Or, if they wish, uh, note an instance where they actually met an honest public official and want to praise that person. If we're going to make this work, we need a robust architecture of what we call horizontal accountability, a variety of independent agencies all on a horizontal plane that include a human rights commission, an ombudsman, uh, and of course an anti-corruption commission, a supreme audit agency, a civil service commission, an electoral commission, all of which share one common feature. They are not under the control of the ruling party or the president. They are autonomous from the workings of partisan politics, and they have the leadership, the resources, the professionalism, and the esprit de corps to serve the purposes of democracy and good governance. The key to doing this is to have some kind of supervising and appointing authority above these that is not under the control of a potentially venal president, prime minister, or ruling party. Improving governance, then, in nascent uh, and troubled democracies requires reform to strengthen these institutions and rules for good governance and the rule of law. And reform is most likely to happen when we get coalitions like the ones in this room, bringing together people from civil society, from below, from within the state, people uh, in the state apparatus who want to see reform, from above uh, political leaders who for one reason or another latch on to the reform agenda, and people in the international community, in aid agencies, governments, and civil societies who want to help them. Together, uh, as we see here in this poster on the right from the Zambian Anti-Corruption Commission, together is the only way we can fight corruption and improve governance. Uh, and uh, transparency is an irreducible condition for doing so. And so I close by noting that in order to achieve transparency and accountability, we need more than just good institutions. We need good laws that ensure we can have access to information that is truly released and not so ruthlessly redacted when it is released that you don't know what's going on. We need to fight for right to information laws, for budget transparency, for civil service reform, and for a robust architecture of rule of law and horizontal accountability agencies that will enable these new democracies to actually work and function to defend and advance freedom in the world. There's no country right now where this agenda is more important from for the international community than the, the first democracy in the Arab world in 40 years, Tunisia. And I'm very glad that my friend, uh, uh, Amira Yayawi, is going to follow me. Thank you very much.